It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, I have with me my co-host, Andy Grabner, for a, a subdued episode of Pure Performance. Hello, Andy. Hello, Brian. You have a very interesting, subtle voice today. Well, we're both kind of uh, <laughs> <laughs> feeling a little slow today, so I figured we can yeah. have more of a, a public radio sort of yeah. version okay. of, our perform- of our podcast today. Yeah, why are you slow today? What's wrong? Oh, it's just been a long day already, and uh, you know, stuff with my my child, and uh, just a lot of work coming in, and feeling overwhelmed, Andy, overwhelmed by life. But okay. that is the the way how it goes, or so it goes, as Kurt Vonnegut yeah. used to say. How about you? You seem very. Uh, when I contacted you today, you seemed a little subdued. Uh, well, it might be related with, if I look out the window and it is April 6th today and it's totally foggy in Boston and it's very strange. It just feels like November and it feels like I have to go to sleep. Um, maybe that's part of the reason. Um, but, uh, no, other than that, I think I'm excited Good. about what we do today because, uh, I think this time we do not have a guest of honor. Right. Well, you are you are my guest, and I'm your guest, kind of. Correct. I would Correct. say in, in this case. And uh, we thought, what are we done? What are we going to talk about today? We are going to, you know, way back when we first started this podcast, uh, just about a year ago, if you believe oh. believe it or not, it was May oh. of last year, and I believe uh, this one is airing in May. So we're about somewhere at our, our one year anniversary. Uh, we had we had talked about some uh, common problem patterns, right? We did mm-hmm. uh, an episode on common Java problem patterns and common .NET problem patterns, and uh, you know it, it's always very there's a lot of them, not a, not a million of them, right? But there there's a finite set of very common problem patterns as, as you've seen over and over again, and we've all seen over and over again. But in those mm-hmm. early podcasts, we can only cover so many of them. So we figured, you know what, it's about time to get back to some of the common problem patterns. And uh, I think, you know, we have some interesting ones today because with the changing um, architecture that's been going on, um, we're seeing some of what we might call new problem patterns, but, you know, we can might even be call them the new old problem patterns. Yeah. So we're going to cu- touch on a couple of those today and mm-hmm. uh, continue from there. Yeah. Cool. What do you want to get started with? Well, let's see. It's not like we didn't discuss this before, so we'll pretend. Uh, I don't know. Let's. Uh, you know, the one thing I've been hearing quite a lot about is is is, is multi threading, okay. and uh, you know we we have you know we're not going to get too deep into it, but a lot of people are probably familiar with. Uh, I believe it's Akka, right? They the, the there's a lot of very highly asynchronous multi-threaded applications out there that are very efficient and very awesome uh, and very confusing when you try to look at what they're doing. Um, but multi-threading in itself is not bad, correct, Andy? No, no, not at all. And no. I think we also need to differentiate a little bit about multi-threading. And I think uh, other other approaches where you talk about events driven, where you then have, uh, you know, multiple threads taking off the work, right. basically really constantly working and nobody's waiting on them per se, but then there's going to be callbacks where you just call the next uh, chain of event. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think this is also one, one thing to uh, understand there's a difference uh, in, in, in just spawning threads and doing something asynchronously honestly versus some of the frameworks that have really been optimized for, uh, for really squeezing the, the, the best out of, uh, out of multiple threads uh, that you have available and uh, just coming up with new development models um, and making hopefully code more efficient and execution more efficient, right? Right. And, and, and I think it goes without saying too, that even with the, if we're not talking about the event-driven, highly you know highly optimized versions, uh, when you're talking, if we're just saying transaction coming comes in and spawns multiple threads for some asynchronous activity, that's not necessarily even bad on its own as well. But there are dangers and pitfalls that can arise, and I, I guess from what you've been seeing a lot in in your share your pure path um, program, which by the way, shameless plug here, Andy. Um, 
runs our free trial program so that when you when you do download our our Atmon program, you can share your peer paths with him and he'll take a look at them, which is where he sees all these problems over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing some 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 patterns when it comes to multi-threading. So what, what these what these problems are that we come across. So exactly, let us discuss yeah. what that is then. Yeah. So first of all, um, I'm I'm not actively looking for these. Pro I'm, I'm I'm not going in and say. Does this have the you know is, is it a multi-threading issue? I typically start with you know, do we have an, do we have a performance problem? Do we have a resource issue? And, and typically you see this by you know load on the system is going up. So I'm looking at uh, at incoming uh, number of transactions, and then I'm looking at uh, uh, response time. Mm -hmm. uh, and typically what we see is that at some point in time, response time simply goes through the roof. And we, at the same time, we see, however, that these uh, transactions are actually not doing a whole lot. They're mainly spending time either in waiting mm -hmm. on something else, or uh, they are actually not doing anything other than, I mean, not actively waiting on an object that is that is then woken up by framework, but actually waiting on the availability of a background thread uh, that they are requiring. So what I've seen more and more so, especially with um, uh, with uh, with frameworks that make kind of these uh, you know uh, asynchronous programming uh, easier, where you can uh, create a work item and put it on a thread in in a queue, and then some background thread uh, picks it up, which is great for developers. But I, what I've what I've been seeing is that. Uh, Sometimes people are misusing that. So one blog post that I just have in front of me, and you can, if you want to read it, it's uh, it's on Dynatrace on the Dynatrace blog. It will link called, to it. Yes. Yeah, it's the detecting uh, the n plus one asynchronous thread problem pattern. Did you just and say n plus one? I know I said n plus it's, one. It's always n plus one, right? No yeah. matter where we go, yeah. but that's not the heart of it, right? Continue. I just wanted to yeah. acknowledge that we did say n plus one yet once again. Yeah. But <laughs> no. please, people. Yeah. So, but in this case, and and thanks to our colleagues in Gdansk, uh, they shared this paper with me because they've been using, uh, they've been using our product to actually analyze the work that they are doing, and then they sent me a pure path, and they they had a problem that they wanted to solve, which was some of the reports were just running too slow, and the reports were querying a lot of data from the database, and then then doing you know some calculation, and so they thought the developers thought, well, if we have to go off a lot to the database multiple times to query data, why not just asynchronous, I mean, synchronous, um, parallelize the whole thing. And so the loop that we have right now where we crunch through the elements, we just spawn multiple threads for every element that we are iterating through in the loop. And then multiple threads will take care of it much faster. And then at the end, we just wait for the result and everything will be fine and faster. So classical, I have a problem divided into smaller pieces, put it into background threads. Now, this worked well in a development environment, right? Because if you're the only one on the system, that's not an issue. But what this really meant is that for every incoming thread that was working on that you know, report request, you had you know, two, five, 10, 50 uh, threads being spawned additionally, depending on how many data items they had to crunch through. And mm -hmm. that's the classical uh, N plus one query problem again. You have one main thread and then for every data item that this main thread tries to process asynchronously, you have another thread, another worker thread, asynchronous worker thread. And obviously, there's two problems with this. First of all, it is uh, a load-related problem. That means the more load you have on the system, at some point, you run out of threads if every incoming thread consumes more than one. You know, right, right. Um, So that means you cannot scale. But even worse, or actually in combination with this, this is also a data-driven problem. Mm -hmm. Because what if you not have to crunch through ten items, but a thousand items, and then do you automatically spawn a thousand threads, and do you have a, a thousand threads available? So, and so I can imagine if you have to spawn a thousand threads, you would also re need the memory for those thousand threads as well. Yeah, or you run into an exception where the JVM probably tells you, well, I cannot give you these threads. Or yeah. at some point, maybe the, even the operating system tells you it's, it's not possible anymore. Right, right, right. So, so definitely you run into resource issues. Now, the intent, understandable, why you want to parallelize some of this, uh, this working, heavy working, heavy lifting activity, but done in this way is not good. And what I then 
the way I see these problems now, uh, when I analyze the data, uh, I, look, I look at these long running pure paths, um, and it's also dis explained in the blog. Uh, what I like about the pure path is not only the end to end traceability, but we also show you which thread is actually executing um, a certain method. So I can see the thread switches when it switches right, right. from one thread to another. And then there's another column which we call the elapsed time. It's like a timestamp. Yeah. It basically tells me when was this method that executed, the next, the next, and it's always relative to the entry point of the transaction. So the entry point is zero, right? Timestamp zero. Mm -hmm. And and there you can easily always see, hey, it's interesting. We are we are we are trying to make a call from the main thread and then passing some work to the background thread. And there I have a gap from one second, five seconds, ten seconds. So that means the system or the mentor is just waiting for the work to be picked up by the next thread. And the question is, why is that? And typically the answer is, well, there's just simply none of these background threads currently available because they are busy because they're used by other main threads that are trying to do a similar thing. Right. It, what, what strikes me about this one is this ties very directly to another common problem pattern we spoke of in that first or second episode ago, a lo another threading issue, right? I think threading issues all, all are probably come from a very similar um, problem, but makes sense, right? That um, when we were looking at time spent on the web server before getting to the JVM or, you know, or the app pool or whatever, where you, where you could say, all right, we were trying to make a, a, a synchronous call back to the JVM and there's a long wait time before it gets to that. And again, you could see that from, from that elapsed time on the thread. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it's just not enough threads. Yeah. And, and, and so what I, what I typically now do, I think as a, as a lesson learned, mm -hmm. um, analyzing these problems. So I always look at, first of all, number of incoming requests on the, on the, on the front, right? How many right. requests are coming on the, in on the Tomcat 10? How many threads are active? And I'll try to actually calculate a, a ratio. So how many threads are active per certain transaction type? Because then you can immediately see, wow, this transaction, you know, they only need one thread. So everything is synchronous, no problem. Oh, this transaction is consuming uh, three threads, this one, 50 threads. Um, so, I, I, I kind of look at this and, and then better understand the real performance and resource characteristic of an implementation. Right. Uh, so this, this is a good um, and, you know, it, uh, one, one thing that I learned. Um, also, another thing that I learned, um, if you have a transaction that is heavily using uh, multiple threads, then what tools like Dynatrace provide is uh, it gives you the total execution time of all the threads. Because even though, let's assume you have you have endless threads available and everything is fast and you never run into a threading issue, but eventually your transaction is consuming resources, CPU, um, CPU cycles on the different threads. So what I always, in, in order not to be fooled by, hi, this, this, this transaction is so fast, it only takes 100 milliseconds. But if I know that it, it takes 100 milliseconds on the main thread and it also consumes 100 milliseconds on 50 other threads that multiplies up to five seconds plus 100 milliseconds. So that's right. always why when you, when you try to optimize multi-threaded applications, then you always need to look at the total execution time um, of, of all the threads that are involved. Uh, and then especially track this over time because you want to know when a code change uh, actually changes the dynamic behavior, and even though the performance to the end perceived by the end user is is still good or maybe even better, it may be that you just you know and then you're now involving so many more background threads and you're in the end consuming a lot of more resources right and, and to just to give a kind of a pro tip to anybody who uses Dynatrace who might be listening um, when you're looking at pure paths or I put the accent on the wrong pure paths. That's the Christopher Walken way of saying it. When you're mm -hmm. looking at pure paths, um, you have three different times you can look at, right? And, and they all reveal different things about these patterns that you're talking about. Your response time is the, um, I was your, your basic time on, on, on the transaction, right? Your response time, let's say it's 50 milliseconds. That's how long it took from the entry point 
uh, for the entry point method to complete. Right? If it spawns off any asynchronous threads, though, that, that is not covered by that. Right? Your execution sum for a pure path is more along the lines of what you're talking about, right? where it's a total of the entry point plus the sum of all of the different threads, even if they're running in parallel. Right, so it's not it doesn't reflect a true time that anybody or any of the systems are being parallelly impacted by, but it's the amount of time that transaction consumes. And then mm -hmm. the third one we have is duration, mm -hmm. right? And duration is going to cover the entry point of that method plus your async times for, um, but it's not going to cover parallel threads, right? So if you have two 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 asynchronous threads fire off at the same time the duration is going to include the length of the longest one. Exactly. The right. duration basically is from uh, when the transaction initially hits your, your JVM, for instance, mm -hmm. until the last asynchronous thread is really done. And, and this is very actually great that you bring it up because this um, is always sometimes misleading if people only look at response time. Right. Uh, and then say, well, look at this. This code is super fast. It responds in 50 milliseconds. But then duration all of a sudden says, well, a second, two seconds, five seconds. Ten minutes. And then they <laughs> oh, 10 minutes, yeah. And basically what that means, the initial request comes in, is super fast, responds back to the end user. But what this request actually does, it spawns off something asynchronously that then goes off and does something. But to the end user, the transaction might be completed in 50 milliseconds. Right. But on the system itself, you know, certain things are happening. So that's why, very good, Brian. So, so just a little pro tip, yeah, just a little pro tip to yeah. any users out there to uh, put a little pepper that in, yeah. in case so, you haven't looked so, at that. Yeah, so response time, this is the time perceived by whoever initiated the transaction. Mm -hmm. Duration is how long does it really take from end to end, including all the asynchronous activity. Right. Uh, and then execution time or total execution time includes all the time of all the threads combined. So we can actually see the real resource footprint right. of that particular transaction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in terms of the, of, in terms of the, the threading, right. Um, as we mentioned, um, threading is multi, you know, multiple threading, multi threading is not necessarily bad. Right. But, Mm -hmm. being too heavy or having these delays is where it does get bad. And uh, another thing, you know, so, so you had mentioned uh, some of the things that you do to look for it manually, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking at the number of requests, how many threads it's spawning, the amount of time it's being spent is being spent there. Um, but again, one, and it's funny that it's me doing the plugs this time, but you know, we, we just want to mention that uh, with a lot of these common problem patterns, you know, if you are using uh, Dynatrace, we will identify currently in six five right we're identifying heavily asynchronous um, transactions exactly. right and then you were mentioning I believe there's something else coming in the next release yeah just in seven to... so yeah so what we do on a pure path to pure path basis ju just what I did manually all the time basically looking at how many threads are involved so we tag a pure path and say this pure path is you know is, is synchronous or this pure path is asynchronous and if it's asynchronous we actually say thread heavy or thread medium but and then this was there since 6.5 and makes it easy to say, show me these pure that are very heavy on, on, on threading. But what we now have with 7, we give you uh, this view uh, over a time frame, over, over a timeline. So you can say, hey, uh, under a certain load condition, or if, if I look at my load pattern over the course of the day, then I can see when load goes up. I all, I all of a sudden see the number of pure paths that have asynchronous issues also go up. Mm -hmm. Or if you have constant load and you are deploying a new version of your app into that environment, if you have if you do some type of continuous performance engineering, continuous performance testing, and you look at Dynatrace and you can see, oh, right now five percent of my threads uh, are heavy on asynchronous on heavy on threading, and after the deployment, it's not five percent, it's fifty percent. So immediately, right. no, you introduced. A, probably a regression, um, and, and and that makes it just so much easier, especially for architects or when you do code reviews to say, oh, before we, do, we probably don't want to let this into production um, because first we want to sit down and figure out was this intentional or not. Right, right. All right. Any any final words on threading? Uh, yeah. No, I think I think uh, what I just like also to build, uh, what I always look at is is just some charts where I I think I mentioned it earlier, but uh, I typically look at incoming transactions mm -hmm. overall. Then I want I look at uh, a number of threads involved. Uh, 
uh, and always look at this ratio. So and that'd if be the you total have number it, of threads, right? So exactly okay. the total number of active threads, the total number of transactions that come in, and obviously if you have a chance and if you have a tool that can do that, then split uh, the transactions up into something that makes more sense for you from a business from from a feature perspective, right? Because right. Uh, typ I, typically in an application you have uh, certain requests that that you see a lot, but typically very fast ones. I don't know, uh, static resource requests or some heartbeats, and they are typically then diluting your your averages. Uh, so if you have a chance um, and say, show me the number of requests that come in on that particular transactions and how many tra threads are involved, they will be perfect. And then tra trace this over time. And, and you know, you could also do that information. You can also track how much, like how much uh, CPU time it's using, or how many, uh, exactly. how many memory resources it's it's using, and then find out well how much is this costing us in our cloud infrastructure exactly. that we're spinning up. Exactly, right. and, and if you want to give give another Dynatrace tip, so we would use business, <laughs> we would use business transactions for that, right? You create a business transaction right. for a particular feature, and then as a result measure. We can say, you know, total CPU time, uh, total execution time, um, total, yeah, total yeah. number of threads, total number of web requests, and all that stuff. This is, this is, yeah, yeah. Because again, as Andy brings up quite often, you know, one of the, one of the things to be looking out for, um, the, the the newest thing to look out for is what is what what is the cost of a feature, right? Mm -hmm. And are you getting, you know, and especially as we were talking to uh, Karenka the other day, you know, uh, maybe you put it out. You find out people like it, and then you go ahead and optimize it, right? And and, and these are all ways you can you can do that. Yep. So, all right. So that's um, the multi-threading, right? And, yep. and uh, we'll go into our next uh, problem pattern now. And this one is everyone's favorite topic, the big buzzword, uh, microservices, right? Mm -hmm. um, microservices and I guess the maybe the problem pattern or, or whatever could be considered nano services, but there are, you know, there, there's a whole bunch that we can talk about in microservices, but we're, we're, we're you know, limited on time. So we're going to, we're going to just start covering a couple pieces, right? Um, mm -hmm. One thing to point out is uh, a lot of the same problem patterns that we have without microservices get repeated with microservices, mm -hmm. right? But with that introduction, Andy, what is the microservice du jour? That you wanted yeah. to bring up today. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I think it, it, it again, it comes back to, and I think you mentioned it in, in your intro, it, it took a word from the blog post. Uh, when microservices becomes become nano, that's actually the title of a blog mm -hmm. post uh, that one of our users wrote, Stephen Ledoux. Uh, he, he showed us, and you can, again, you can go on, on the blog and maybe we post yeah, a we'll link, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Um, but basically he was explaining that they were they were basically ripping apart the monolith into into microservices, which is obviously great, but they were going too granular. Uh, and what the too granular actually meant is that they had one call again coming in in the front, and everything that used to be done in the monolith, maybe in in the single in the, in the same thread and the same process, obviously. Uh, now, instead of processing all of this in, in the monolith, in one container, they were having many, many calls going to these new services that were so fine-grained that they simply, you know, had a, a cascading effect almost where um, you, you have instead of, you know, one front-end microservice calls a back-end microservice, the front-end calls 20 times the back-end microservice, mm -hmm. and that microservice calls another 20 times the next microservice um, because they were just not, I think, not thinking about correctly on how to structure the services um, in, in uh, how granular they should be or or how, you know, which which functionality should actually be combined in one service and where you need another one. Um, and I think this is also where it's it's so critical before you sit down and do your microservice architecture, that you actually uh, do some dependency analysis. Mm -hmm. So if you really, if you really rip your monolith apart uh, across maybe uh, class lines or functions, even then first think about what are the dependencies. How often do these classes call each other? How often do these functions call each other? And are you aware of the fact that when you then make a call, that you have a round trip 
over network right, uh, right. that you have to marshal and unmarshal a call, right? Depending on which protocols you use, that can be quite quite heavy. So so these are the things that we've seen. So just um, a, um, uh, a a misuse, too busy, too chatty microservices. And I, and I think the it seems like it would be something very common, right? Because everyone, as we've discussed before, a lot of people are still moving in this direction, right? So everybody is falling in love with the idea of we're going to, we're going to break up our monolithic application. We're going to go to microservices. We're going to do a great CI CD pipeline. We're going to, you know, we're going to do everything DevOps and we're going to be the next, uh, well, they're not unicorns anymore, but stallions or horses or whatever. Right. We, um, and the, I almost feel that internally at an organization, there's a, there's a great risk to see how far they can break it down. Like we could take this giant monolithic thing and break it down to 5,000 services. Look how cool this is. They're all individual, right? We're all individuals. If you ever watched life of Brian, um, you know, but, but that almost feels like it's an accomplishment, right? How far we could break it down. But the issue then comes into exactly what you're saying is if there's a, especially in the case of a one-to-one relationship, you, you, you went too far mm-hmm. and now exactly. you're adding slowness and overhead and resource consumption to that because now you have to make a network call. Um, mm-hmm. And, 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 and that analysis, yeah, that's very important. I mean, again, you can maybe look at your code, you can look at some of these things and get an idea, but I think the, 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 the next important step is then to, to properly, when you, when you make your first attempt at your, your break apart, you know, when you first break it apart and start testing it through, take a look at those dependencies at that point as well yeah. uh, and, yeah, and, and monitor the calls between them and everything else. Start, yeah, going. Yeah. yeah. No, and maybe again, um, you know, we have to give another, I mean, the, the, the way I would do this, uh, if I have a tool like Dynatrace uh, available, um, I, you know, obviously the pure path gives you a great overview to see which method and which component calls which other component. But in this case, I would actually think the sequence diagram that we have mm-hmm. in, in Dynatrace is actually really great because it shows you very nicely um, how components communicate with each other and can be a good indicator on which components are more isolated already and therefore are better candidates of, of, of ripping them out of the monolith and putting it into a service. Right. So, um, so that's one, that's one thing to, to keep in mind. So do your dependency analysis before you do anything, uh, like just, um, you know, build, build the building microservice just because you can build microservices. It doesn't make sense. Right. Uh, and then you also mentioned the, uh, the one to one relationship, uh, I think Martin Edmeyer, he wrote a blog post about this, right. uh, where he also talks about um, at detecting these these very tightly coupled services. And and if they are really tightly coupled, then again, think about does this really need to be an, an extra microservice? If it has to be, then at least be smart enough about the deployment of those. Because if you have very tightly coupled microservices, then also please deploy them close to each other to yeah. actually avoid the overhead of potential network latency. So that would be a bad candidate for putting one in private cloud and the other in, in the public cloud? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's that's for sure, and that's uh, and and these are all things that you can that you have to consider, obviously, and that you can already, you know, analyze and and right. uh, before you actually go into production. Uh, and this is something that I would hope software architects uh, are are doing, and I'm sure that most people do, but. It seems it, it happens, right? And that's why we have these blog posts from customers to tell us about it. Mm-hmm. The world is not perfect, right? And uh, and so yeah. So this is this is one of the problem patterns, just too too fine grain, and then in in a way to call to name it again, the n plus one query problem. Yeah. Uh, because we, if if you if you are making this so fine grained, and you have existing code that makes in a loop calls to a certain class and this class is now a microservice, then these calls in the loop become microservice calls, right? This was one of my, one of my first blog posts uh, I, I, I did uh, on from monolith to microservices, the N plus one query problem between microservice calls, the Swedish company uh, with the search service. And, um, and so be aware of that. Um, it, you know, it's, it's amazing how much the N plus one query pops up everywhere. Yeah. You know, it's almost yeah. like a plague. <laughs> really, yeah. I mean, it really is. It's like there's no getting rid of it. it it's just, it, it's astounding. Yeah. Well, the thing is also, that, I mean, I understand it too because um, 
because I think uh, development frameworks are, you know, may make it easy for developers to build stuff in a very fast way and sometimes they hide away complexity and these frameworks are all also not always perfect and also sometimes generic and if you use it in a generic way and you don't think about how to adapt them and configure them for your use case then you just end up with with things like that right when we used to mm -hmm. talk about hibernate over the last couple of years and it's the same hibernate is a great framework but yeah. if you use it if you don't configure it and adapt it to your use cases then it can do some horrible things yeah and, and, and the one warning always with the n plus one query is you know you might even look at a transaction and say hey this transaction only takes you know 200 milliseconds to execute from end to end i don't care that the, there's an n plus one query and, and in fact my n plus one either query or service is only contributing 20 milliseconds to the whole thing, right? But don't let that fool you because there's a lot more than just the amount of time, right? There's the amount of threads, there's the amount of connections, there yeah. are there are the, the, bytes. The, the bytes, there's also the unexpected changes in traffic or changes in usage that can t suddenly take an, and blow that up on you. Um, so, you know, I just, uh, there was a really great example. I wish I remembered it. As we were talking about it, I, I remember hearing about uh, with one of our customers where they had one of those exact situations where it was so minor. And then the next day it took and blew up on them for like a completely unpredictable reason. But just because it existed, it was, it, it was a, uh, a liability. Um, so I would just say, don't, don't ignore the N plus one query mm -hmm. or the N plus one actually, pattern problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, I always like analogies. Um, the analogy with microservices that always comes to mind for me is if you go to a supermarket and if you go to, you know, you have your basket of items and then mm -hmm. you go to the checkout and then let's say you have five items. And if the cashier, if, if he's a service and the only thing he does well is basically putting the final price into the, into the system and then giving it a total. But every time he needs to get the price for a single item, he needs to call another service Mm -hmm. to tell him the price so in this case I, I give him my first item then he needs to walk over to the person that he tells him the price comes back puts the price in and then i give him the second item that's basically kind of the analogy for me so the, the, the question is how fine granular do we need to have these services um do we really always need to go to that other service to get a certain uh, part of information Right. Um, and also how far away should this person be or this service be to optimize the paths, right? That's the way, that's the end, um, what we have to, to care about. Um, you know, I used to work at a supermarket and used to work at checkout. Yeah, really? Oh yeah. 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 And my favorite was always having to do a price check. It's always the worst because then suddenly everybody in line would groan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's that's what your customers are going to do if you have to do this this piece, right? They're going to groan. Um, yeah, but the, so. but the cool thing with this is, right? If you ha if you have if you see the cashier as a microservice, you can scale it out by right. just adding more cashiers to it. Yeah. That's the way. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. All right, um, we're at about thirty minutes. Do we want mm -hmm. to um, go ahead and tackle the last one we were going to? Sure. Why not? Can. Sure. Okay. So. Yeah. We had one more problem pattern we wanted to discuss today. Um, we are not going to open up an entire Pandora's box because uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about memory, right? And obviously, as soon as we say memory, there are about you know a million things we can talk about yeah. and very, very in-depth. Very you know, Memory is very, very complex, um, and it's very scary. Anytime you see a memory problem, that's when I think everybody kind of starts shaking a little bit because... They can just be so painful. But today we're going to take a look at one that's hopefully not as painful, not too painful. We're going to take a look at gar uh, garbage collection, right? Mm -hmm. And we all know garbage collection is necessary. It has a great function. It's part of life, right? It's, it's, it's like breathing. It's an application breathing. It has to have, or I should say, really, it's kind of like going to the bathroom for the application. Or that's why they call it a dump, right? Um, <laughs> and the heap. We have all the fun terminology, right? But mm -hmm. the point is, garbage collection happens, right? And no matter what, there's going to be some kind of impact to your application. And again, that's the cost of running an application that does garbage collection. The problem is when that has an impact on your application that is beyond or that's a negative impact that you can feel and, you know, or your customers can feel, right? So let's get into a little bit of GC, yeah. Andy. Well, yeah, GC or I think what we call it. Suspension, uh, Because right? it's suspension, yeah. It's, it's really, 
it's really when the garbage collector kicks in and actually suspends the JVM or the runtime uh, and actually suspends your current critical transactions that are executing. And and that's what you I think what you try to get to is mm -hmm. uh, garbage collection itself you know has to do you know it has to run and and it will obviously when it does major GCs. Uh, block your JVM for a while. The question is how long are these blocks and who are they impacting? And maybe they are impacting transactions mm -hmm. where you have SLAs with, right? You, you have a certain service level agreement or you know if it goes beyond a certain uh, threshold, then you are going to uh, make your users unhappy or whoever else unhappy. So and that's why what, what, what we always look at uh, is uh, suspension time impact on transaction response time. Mm -hmm. So in our terminology, from a diamond risk perspective, we always talk uh, about uh, runtime suspension and uh, and the portion of um, the, the the portion of time it contributes to the overall response time of a transaction. Now, interestingly so, enough, let me cut you off there because we just before mm -hmm. we were talking about response time duration and execution time mm -hmm. uh, total, right? And I believe mm -hmm. when we look at this, we're talking about um, uh, the suspension impact on the duration. Exactly, but I mean the, the, the suspension duration on, on everything that happens within the execution of a transaction. That's true. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, uh, so I, as far as which one of those ones we're looking at when we, when we take yeah. a look at that from that point of view. Yeah. Well, I think it will. It will. It impacts. Resp it will. It will impact response time and duration because oh, of it course. will. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, I think the the, the the thing that I'm always looking at is. Um, when we are analyzing performance-related problems due to garbage collection, uh, we always look at the percentage of time that uh, the, the runtime suspends uh, uh, the threats mm -hmm. and which threats are currently executing business-critical features and how long they are actually suspended and uh, what the percentage is of that suspension time to the overall execution time of the transaction. Um, and so I typically, you know, put graphs up uh, when I analyze uh, load tests or uh, systems in production mm -hmm. and I look at uh, overall response time and then I look at response time without without uh, garbage collection impact right uh, because this is actually then the ratio and what I like uh, again it's enough and we're doing a lot of pitches today with Dynatrace but well. in Dynatrace you can also <laughs> do a, a ratio with a ratio measure yeah, I was just gonna say Reinhardt and I do that a lot too in our in our things too exactly yeah so the ratio measure is great because it calculates the ratio between the response time and the response time without garbage collection. And so you can actually see what the real percentage impact really is. Right. And, and if you chart this over time, then you can actually see at which uh, under which load you, you hit a certain threshold where garbage collection really becomes a problem for you. Mm -hmm. uh, also at which time of the day when you have certain load patterns, uh, you, may, you may hit or a certain threshold. Change. Or the code oh, it's change. a code change, yeah, yeah, you know exactly. So if you are deploying a new a new version, and then you automatic all of a sudden you see a memory behavior changes, and now you have more impact. Um, and then obviously the, the re remediating actions can be different ones, right? It could be your memory behavior changes for a good reason because you changed some code and that just requires more memory, but maybe you forgot about to adapt uh, your GC settings, your memory settings, uh, or maybe you really have um, uh, you know, memory issues where you are, you are simply consuming too much memory, causing too many garbage collection runs in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you obviously need to do your memory diagnostics and, and figure out how to, how to be uh, more efficient with memory usage. Maybe you're keeping those threads alive too long. <laughs> you're keeping those threads alive too long, yeah. Um, the... So the, so the interesting thing about this one, this is a pretty difficult one to look at, right? Because this one uh, requires um, using JVMTI, correct? Well, in order, in order to, to see, yeah. I mean, we could in see a GC run, we could see, you know, some of those pieces, but but so, some of the yeah. nitty-gritty details. Yeah, so I think what, you, what you're getting to is uh, there's different approaches on how to measure this, right? Uh, let's say there's different approaches on how to how to instrument uh, JVMs and CLRs. And for, for Java now, uh, there's two options, right? You have a Java agent, uh, which mm -hmm. is convenient and easy. Uh, the only problem with the Java-based agent is that it runs within the JVM. So the code that the tool 
uses to actually analyze performance is also suspended if the garbage collector picks in, uh, kicks in, mm-hmm. and therefore the, this this um, this tool doesn't even know that uh, the garbage collection just happened. Uh, and there's the other approach that has been around for a little longer, which which is you know using the native interfaces of the JVM, the JVM TI, the tooling interface, mm-hmm. um, where you kind of sit outside of the runtime uh, and therefore actually understand when the GC is triggered, how long it takes, and also who is impacted by it. And this is then the, uh, this is then the approach where you can really uh, figure out what is the real impact of a GC suspension on which threads. And if you know the threads and what they're executing, uh, then you can also um, uh, you know, assign it to uh, your, your business features and you can say, oh, right. this feature was impacted by 50 milliseconds, which is 60% of our overall response time. And it's a critical feature and that's not acceptable. Right. And, and the interesting thing, too, is, you know, you could with much less success. Right. If, if you're looking at some of the JMX metrics type and all, and you could see, all right, there was a garbage collection ran. It ran for 200 milliseconds and it ran at 10.05 today. And at 10.05 today, we also saw a spike in response time. So we'll assume that that was because of the GC, right? But that, again, is kind of, you're correlating. You're, you're, or yeah. you're, 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 you're tying two events together um, that look like they're related, but they might not be. So, so getting it's to that JVM TI yeah. tooling um, yeah. aspect is where you get that definitive answer. Um, yeah. So it's, it's Actually, just. And I never thought about that. That's a good one. That's a very right. good one. Yeah. If you, if you just look at the. That's actually, yeah. Because there could uh, be actually, plenty of other things going on, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. But you also wouldn't know that impact to those, um, to, to the business functions as well. So the, that JVMTI piece is, is really important. And I know it sounds like I'm plugging, but it, it, it's. You know, when I learned about this piece, I think about four and a half years ago or something, or maybe five now, it's been a while, you know, um, I just understood the criticality of it. Um, yeah. And so I'd love to. Uh, and by the way, I think we had, um, if people want to learn a little more, we have. You did a great performance uh, clinic on that, didn't you? I did a performance clinic too, but what I also wanted to say, we have the Java, we have the book, we have the Java Enterprise book. Uh, we oh, wrote that's a book, right. A, a while ago, uh, so if you Google, it's on the on the website. It's a free book. We'll put a um, link up. We'll put a link up. But it's a link uh, up, yeah. Uh, where we where I think it was Michael Kopp back then. He um, he wrote several. He, I think he wrote all the chapters on memory management, explained how garbage collection works and also the impact of garbage collection. Uh, that was a phenomenal a phenomenal piece that he wrote. It's under, I believe, Java Enterprise Performance ebook. I just Googled for Java Enterprise Performance uh, Dynatrace, and, and it's under dynatrace.com slash resources slash ebooks slash Java book. Oh, yeah. So what did you, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll put the, the link up, but for people who don't yeah. know the link, what did you did? Uh, Dynatrace Java, what did you search for? Dynat- Dynatrace Java book memory. That's yeah, what I think I, it comes up like ebook Dynatrace. Yeah. So. Exactly. It's, yeah. So you, you'll see that there. It's definitely good. That's where actually I, I learned, started really learning about memory was from uh, from the early version of that book that was being put up there. Um, so it's a great thing. And, and uh, the, the the nice thing is, even though it was written, you know, several years ago, re- memory doesn't change too much. This is yeah, not it like... It holds true. Yeah. Right. So uh, definitely still worth going into. Um, anything else on, on the memory there? Well, I think memory, as I said, is, as you said in the beginning, is a huge topic, right? I think right. we should have probably other sessions where we talk, can talk about object journeying, where we can talk about mm-hmm. memory leaks um, and, and different ways to analyze uh, memory problems. Uh, but for this particular one here, I think it's just important to understand that try to figure out what the real impact of garbage collection is on your business functions. Um and figure out if this is load related, if it comes in through a different deployment that you had, uh, or you know, in, in case certain um, memory aggressive uh, features are executed and then impacting all the other features that are currently executing in parallel. Uh, but yeah, always always try to figure out what is the impact uh, of, of garbage collection suspension. Absolutely, and if you, um... For anybody listening, if there are certain aspects of memory you would like to hear us discuss, um, by all means, please uh, tweet it at us. You can tweet at pure underscore DT. 
um, or at either one of our regular Twitter handles. So at Grabner Andy or at Emperor Wilson, um, or you can email us at pureperformance.dynatrace.com. Any other kind of um, uh, problem pattern type of things that you may uh, be interested in that we haven't covered yet, please uh, as well, let us know and we'll, we'll, we'll dive into them. Um, we're always looking for finding out what is interesting to you. I'm, I'm still sounding all public radio. With... <laughs> <laughs> I think this, this will be, I'll call myself silky brown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, I Andy, as always, um, the, the, the problem patterns are, are great and, and, I'm so glad that you see so many of them. Uh, <laughs> we all see them quite, quite often. And, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners run into them all the time. Uh, and hopefully we're doing a little to help you identify or be aware of some of the more common ones. Cause as you told, told uh, myself and many audiences over and over again, right? The, these, we call them common because they are common. They happen everywhere and they happen in the best of shops and they happen in the worst of shops. Um, there's just no getting away from them. It's kind of like mosquitoes. Um, they're always there somewhere. Um, so again, great stuff there. Um, any, anything that you'd like to, any final words from you, Andy? Uh, no, not really. Just, uh, you know, keep, keep, keep sending us data yeah. uh, and keep, keep approaching us with, uh, with things that we can then take, analyze and then bring it to a broader audience, either through the podcast or through blog posts. I think with that, we can all make our little contribution right. in, uh, in improving the engineering world. Excellent. Well said. Give back. There you go. That's what it is. And uh, we're having our fun drive. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, well, with that, I'd like to thank you, Andy, for... Thank you for doing this for me. And, you know, again, it's, it's about a year. So let's uh, mm -hmm. wax nostalgically for half a second. Uh, and thank you for all of our listeners um, who have been enabling us to do this. We do this as part of our uh, part of our day job. Right. So because we have listeners like you wonderful people, we get to continue doing this and we really enjoy it. So uh, just a big shout out to everyone who's uh, and, and everyone who listens and everyone who's encouraged us to do this, especially uh, the one, the only Mark Tomlinson, who was our he's the one who kept pushing the two of us to uh, to do this. So shout out to Mark. And uh, mm -hmm. I guess we'll give a little shout out to Steve. Yeah, Steve is listening to us on the way into work. He told us. Yeah. All right. And also Brett. Yes. Hi, Brett. Guest of the show. Anyhow. And uh, all right. Well, we'll talk to everybody. We'll we'll see you all soon. And um, until next time, ciao, ciao. Ciao. Yeah.